and worked with multi-level models in the past. Uh, have, you, have you worked with multi-level models at all, or is it something very new? Okay, good. Um, a lot of us have been confused with multi-level models. A few months ago, actually just, just under a year ago, I was very confused. There was a lot of terminology used that I did not understand at all. And then I learned the Bayesian approach, and now I understand it. So <laughs> hopefully this will help for you. Um, we're going to look at both Bayesian, uh, the Bayesian way of doing it. Actually, first we're going to learn the frequentist way, the classical way, um, and then do a bit more advanced stuff with the Bayesian uh, approach. Uh, and you'll see that you can do some pretty cool stuff with that. Topic. Hopefully it'll also help you understand uh, the general uh, concepts behind multi-level models and how we can set things up. Um, so it's good that everyone today uh, is capable of running R. Uh, you could, based on what you're learning today, I'm sure you'll easily be able to run it in any other program if you wanted to. Um, but the, the, the model of the models work really well in R, and if you're running the Bayesian approach, the easiest way is to run it is through R uh, using JAGS. Okay, so you need, um, if you really want to follow along everything, uh, R, R Studio preferably, JAGS, which is a, a program that is independent of R that runs Bayesian models. But you can call it to R, and that way it's easy. You can import your data directly into JAGS, and you can get the data out of JAGS directly to R, and you can play around with it. Uh, so that's the easiest way is to uh, write it through R. Um, there's an R code file, which has the code that we're running today. Uh, I apologize, I did post it uh, sort of late last night. Um, you can also download these slides, by the way, here, uh, along with the data sets, and you should install all those packages there. Uh, did that work for everyone? Yeah, OK. Okay, so this is what we're going to be doing today. So first, uh, we're going to look at why multi-level, uh, which are also known as hierarchical models, are useful. Why would we possibly want to use them? Um, and rather than uh, trying to convince you that these are the best things we should be using, I'm going to give you an example, and hopefully it'll be clear why it might be useful to write multi-level models rather than classical, uh, you know, single-level regression models. Uh, then we're going to look at some frequentist examples. Uh, frequentist. Uh, meaning classical uh, multi-level models, uh, non-Bayesian, and uh, we're going to uh, see that those have some limitations, and then I'm going to choose some, some Bayesian analysis. You're going to get a general idea of uh, what Bayesian statistics are about and why they can be useful, particularly for multi-level models. Uh, then we're going to look at some Bayesian multi-level models, starting out with the two-level model, which are basically the same models that we ran in the frequentist version, just now a Bayesian version. And then we're going to do a three-level model, uh, which you can also do in, in frequentist multi-level models, but it, it's easier to do and probably faster in the Bayesian version. Uh, we're only going to look at the Bayesian version of that one. Yeah, hopefully, at that point, you'll really understand the power of multi-level models and, and what they can do and become intuitive for you. Um, you'll be able to understand a model that is relatively complex. Because most people hear a three-level model, it sounds really complicated, and they think, this is not going to work, no one's going to understand, but hopefully it'll make sense to you. Any questions about what we're covering today? OK, good. Um, so we're going to start out with an example. So the example I'd like to work with today is this, uh, this paper by uh, Van der Eyck, uh, 2006. Actually, Van der Eyck uh, et al. Has anyone heard of this paper? Has anyone read it? I think at least one person in this room has. <laughs> um, so essentially what they propose is a different approach to studying voting behavior, to studying uh, people's vote choice. So rather than using the conventional approach, which involves uh, taking a categorical variable where you have uh, each person's vote choice or vote intentions, whatever, and then you run multilingual logits or multilingual probits, whatever kind of model to try to explain why people pick one party over others, uh, what they say is we should use continuous dependent variables. So they propose this dependent variable, which is something like uh, how likely is it that you would ever vote for a particular party if you were asked about different parties. Um, they also propose a way of Analyzing these uh, these questions, uh, which involves using uh, uh, what I consider co somewhat complicated conditional logit model, uh, and involves using running um, two-step models, and which are somewhat problematic and complicated. I think hard to interpret, both for the person who's doing the analysis and also for the person who's reading the paper. Um, and they also don't really account for all the uncertainty in uh, the estimation of parameters. So I'm going to try to propose a different way of doing this today. Um, the dependent variable we're going to have isn't the exact same dependent variable, but uh, I actually prefer this dependent variable. It's a question that's asked in many surveys, including in, in all, uh, I believe, all of the surveys uh, that are part of the comparative study of electoral systems, which you might know of as CSCS, which is a huge 
uh, project with election studies from many, many countries. Um, today we're going to work with a small subset of these studies. I um, non-randomly picked 11 elections. Um, I tried to make this somewhat interesting, but the idea, the main idea was to, to try to pick um, elections uh, where we have all the data we need, all the variables, uh, and also uh, that it, so the data set would be relatively small. Uh, so we can try to run some of these today and not have to wait a few hours for models to run. Um, so it's, the data set is relatively small. We have data on 66 parties in those 11 elections. Okay, so the question uh, asked is this one here, and you don't necessarily have to read it. Uh, but it's basically a, a like this like question where people are asked that. Okay, let's pull the screen. Oh, is it? Oh, I thought it was. Oh, it is. Okay. Um, so basically, the question asked is um, is how much people like or dislike political parties? People are given a scale from 0 to 10, where 0 means they totally dislike a party, 10 means they like it a lot, and people are asked on that scale uh, wh how much they like or dislike political parties. Um, so they're asked generally between 5 and 9 parties in the CSCS. We're going to take 6 parties uh, per election. And we're going to, going to try to explain why people like or dislike political, particular political parties. Um, okay, so here's some results, but I want to go into R. Um, so I'm going to drag my R studio. Now my studio over there. If you know, I'm going to turn off the lights. That would be better. Okay, so here you can see uh, our studio. Here's the code, uh, which I believe you all have. Go to the top of the page. It's actually called multilevel.r, not multilevel. People I just wanted to test things, but it's the exact same file. Um, so first, load in the data set. So you need to use the foreign package to uh, load it in because it's, it's a standard data set. So you should change this here to whatever directory contains the files. So we're going to go with whatever directory, directory contains the data set. Uh, and then you run these three lines to load it in. Okay, then. I know this is Okay, so I'm going to run this. Uh, and now the data set is loaded in. Uh, and you can look at the uh, at the data set, we'll basically just see how big it is by using the dim command, which gives you the dimensions. So it shows you that it has 83,851 rows and nine columns. So it's a pretty big data set. Um, it's a long data set. Do you all know what long data sets are? So uh, a long data set is a data set that has um, rows that correspond to individuals. I'm trying to figure out where the best place to put this. Maybe I'll just keep on the screen. Individuals and um, parties, or whatever they're asked to evaluate. So there's a row for each respondent and each party. So each respondent shows up not in, in six different rows. So there's a row for you know, respondent one, party one, and respondent one, party two. Um, and that's, that's as opposed to a, a wide data set where, there'd be, where each party would have its own column. Um, so rather than having a column for each party, we have a different row for, for each uh, respondent party pair. Okay, so today we're going to be looking at the relationship between religiosity and um, and like dislike scores. So uh, so here I created a variable called religious, which uh, which is coded one if people consider religion to be somewhat or very important to them, and coded zero if people consider religion to be not at all or not very important to them. And we're going to look at the relationship between that variable and um, like dislike scores. So we're going to start out by running uh, one level, a single level model. So there's a classic OLS linear regression, uh, which is here on this line, uh, we see mod 1. So run that, I've included a, a, you know, a few control variables. Um, I'm assuming everyone knows how to run a single level regression, there's nothing too unusual there. Okay, so we run the model, um, and now we can get a summary of it. We can see the coefficient estimates, and then uh, the hypothesis test. We see there's a lot of significant stuff here. Does, does everyone understand why we have all these stars? Everyone understands that you know it's a huge data set, so basically everything's going to be significant. Um, 
and we see the coefficient on religious uh, religiosity. So religious yes means that it's you know that it's uh, yes means one. Um, we see that as positive and it's significant. Uh, so that means that people who are more religious tend to like parties more than people who are less or who are not religious. Um, here we have the code to create the uh, the, the uh, table on like PDF here for the presentation. Um, and actually, but I'll just show you guys stuff in in, in our studio. It'll be easier that way. Um, we can also make uh, a graph here, uh, which allows us to see the distribution of the, the distributions of uh, I'll zoom in. The distributions of like like dislike scores among both uh, non-religious and religious people, and we see that they're basically identical. Uh, are you guys familiar with these types of plots, box plots? You know, they basically show the distribution of a continuous variable. Um, so we found a significant effect, but uh, basically identical distributions. So there is some kind of difference, but it's very small. Um, now I'm wondering, what, what problems are there with that analysis that we just read? Does anyone have an idea? Why might we not want to do uh, what we just did? No ideas? Why is that not necessarily the most appropriate way of, uh, of running a, an analysis of these data? The residuals will be calculated or on groups. Yeah, but uh, I mean, in terms of what we were assuming, uh, what, what, what do we assume there that we might not want to assume? When we, when we put all the parties together, people's evaluation of all the parties together, what do we assume? Well, that there is no difference between how people evaluate the parties uh, according to, to what is the party that you prefer. Right. Um, yeah, so we're making tons of assumptions um, in particular uh, that there are related differences across parties. Slide with assumptions. Um, yeah, so some of the major assumptions. Uh, oh, this is one. I, I was trying a lot of different variables, and originally I was, I was working with sex, and they thought, oh, this, uh, this should be uh, religiosity. We're basically assuming that um, the, the relationship between our independent variable and independent variable is the same across parties. So we're assuming that uh, people who are more religious like parties more, uh, and all parties, regardless of the particular party we're, we're, we're interested in. Um, and then it does not defer across parties. Uh, are we willing to assume that? Probably not. It doesn't make much sense. Uh, another thing is we're assuming that average scores are the same across parties. Because um, you know when you run a, a, a linear model, there's an intercept and there's a slope. So the intercept essentially gives you, I mean, not exactly, but basically, basically it represents the average score. Um, and we're assuming that that's the same across models. So we're assuming the intercept and the slope is, are the same. So that both the average level and the change associated with the independent variable is the same across parties. That's what we're assuming. And that's not very likely. Um, some other things, uh, we're also assuming there are no differences across elections. So I'm just going to tell you now, we actually have a third level we're going to look at today, which is elections. So the second, uh, so uh, there's respondents uh, and, and parties, and then, and then parties the second level, and then elections third level. So assuming basically that everything is the same across both parties and elections. And we could think about a, a, a fourth level, which would be countries. We could think of the elections being nested in countries. So we could think of your four level structure here, respondents, parties, elections, countries. So when we, when we run a single level model, we assume that everything is the, the same. Uh, intercept slopes are the same across parties, elections, countries, and nothing, and nothing changes. And nothing is different um, across those. And I think, um, those are pretty poor assumptions. Uh, most people would not really agree with that. Okay, um, these kinds of multi-level structures are very common in the social sciences. There are lots of classic examples. Um, probably one of the most common examples you'll, you'll read about in introductory multi-level models uh, books is that of students in schools. So you want, uh, want to evaluate students' performance on standardized tests, for example, and you want and you have independent variables that are at both the student level and the school level. So you want to look at the impact of, of, of uh, students, parents' uh, income, for example, on their success. And you also want to look at the impact of 
how much the school spends per student or something like that. So you have variables both at the individual level and at the school level. Um, so the second example is basically what we have here. So we have survey responses for different parties. So they're both uh, individual level variables and party level variables. And then you know you could go further out and look at election level variables and country level variables. Um, and also, panel data is quite common, and this is also multi-level data. So, so it could be you have test results or survey responses over time, so different age people's uh, at, at different ages uh, over people's lifetime, uh, different years. Uh, this is also a multi-level model, and there are many, many other examples in the social sciences of this type, this type of, 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 of data. So, multi-level model is quite common. Um, what, what do you think would happen if we didn't run a multi level model where we should? You shouldn't read this. Um, but um, yeah, basically, you could either find an effect that isn't real. Uh, so, partly because the end is so big, you, you know, everything there is significant. We found something that actually might not be real. It might be due to contextual variables. It might be something about the parties, that, but not the individuals, that explains that we find an effect. It might also be the opposite. There might actually be a relationship between, for example, religiosity and liking or disliking parties, but it's actually cancelled out because it varies across parties. So it might be that for some parties it's positive and for others it's negative. And if we just pool all the data together, pooling means you just forget the fact that they're, basically that's what we did. You ignore the fact that these are values of different parties. Um, if you just pool them together, uh, these effects can just cancel out and you basically find that. So either you could find something that's false, you could find, you could not find something that's true, but at the very least, what we do find, the rest of it's probably going to be biased uh, if we ignore uh, that there are multiple levels of analysis. Okay, so now uh, let's find, uh, let's look at some solutions to this problem. Uh, we'll go back into our studio. Yes. Studio. Okay, um, so now we're going to go down to uh, here where we loaded uh, LME4. So this is, this is a package that allows you to run multi level models. So these are classical, uh, classic frequentist models, nothing too special, it's not Bayesian yet. Um, and it's one of the many packages. Uh, you could run, as I said, the same stuff in, uh, in, in Stata or whatever you want. Um, so if you want to do that, you could probably you could probably convert the code pretty easily. So here the model structure is very similar, the, the code we use. Um, the command is LMER instead of LM. Uh, and here we're sort of resting like to select scores on the same variables. The only difference here is what we add here in, in parentheses. So here in this first model, this is the first solution. So remember we said there were a number of problems that, with that initial uh, single level model. One of them was that we assume that there's the same average scores for each party, that some parties are, so we were assuming that uh, no party is more like than you know, any other party, that they all have, on average, they have the same scores. Um, so here we're going to relax that assumption, we're going to allow the intercepts to vary. And the way we do that is by adding this here, uh, so in parentheses we put one uh, vertical bar party, this, this says here that we allow the intercept to vary across parties. Um, Hopefully everyone knows that the intercept is basically a coefficient times one, so that's why it's one for our party. Um, so we'll, we'll run that and see, uh, see what we get. Okay, so here we see a summary of the results. Um, so first there are what, what they call fixed effects. So fixed effects here are basically the average effect. Um, and they don't really vary. Um, this is these here don't vary except for the intercept, because we just allow the intercept to, to vary. So for the, these, these here, for all the variable coefficients, the slopes, these are basically just coefficients that don't vary, and then for the intercept, it's the average intercept. Um, so we can see basically the same thing. Uh, the effect of religiosity is quite significant. Uh, strong t-value, uh, you know, it's over 2, which is generally the threshold, uh, positive again. Uh, now we can if you want to see how uh, the coefficients vary, actually in this case the coefficient is just the intercept, how it varies across, um, how it varies across 
parties, what we have to do is look at what this particular package calls random effects, which are basically just uh, the uh, basically the deviations from the mean for each party. So how each party is different from the mean. So we just run that and okay here. So here we see for each party. So the way that parties are labeled, the first is the country, then there's the year, then there's a the number for the party. You'd have to look it up in the CSCS code book to find out what party they are. So see, this tells you how much more or less like the party is than the average party in the data set. Uh, so some are positive, some are negative. Um, you can also plot this here. So this gives you a, a nice plot with all the intercepts for all the parties in the data set. So you can see there's quite a bit of variability. So that assumption was really bad that they're all that the average score is the same for all parties. See, one party uh, is a bit under um, three points on the scale, less like the average party, and then some parties are close to two points more like the average party. So there's quite a bit of variability around that mean for the intercept. Does that make sense? Okay, now the second solution uh, is to, um, to allow both the intercept, oh sorry, before that, um, before, before that, we're, we're, now we're going to try to explain why the intercept varies. Um, so now th this is a, so the first model was a varying intercept model, because inter the intercept varies. Now we're going to try to explain why it varies. So this is a varying intercept, uh, which is a model, because a model varying intercept model. Um, and we're going to see whether ideology explains that. So I, I created a dummy variable, which, uh, which is coded one if a party is to the right of the center in a particular election, based on expert scores. Uh, and so it's coded one if it's to the right and zero if it's to the left of the center of that election. Uh, so it's, it's all relative to the, to the center. So uh, we might think that people who are, uh, oh, yeah, okay, for, for now we might just think that, for example, parties on the right are more like, the parties on the left are more like, whatever our theory is. Um, we'll test that. So the way we, this is basically an interaction between the coefficients, the, the intercept, and, um, and uh, this variable here, LR. So uh, it's an interaction because basically LR is multiplied by 1, which is, is the variable that is constant of uh, which is the intercept. Uh, so we put it here. Um, but we still have uh, the intercept to vary. Um, this is actually more confusing, I find, than the Bayesian way of writing this out. Uh, it's, the Bayesian way is longer, but here it's, it's confusing. But basically, this means that it's an interaction because it's multiplied by 1. Uh, and this is, a, this, is a, this is a variable at level 2. It doesn't vary across. It doesn't vary across um, respondents, it varies across parties. So we will run that. And now we'll get a summary. Okay, so now we still have these fixed effects here. Uh, but now there's actually an added one, which is LR. So this, these here are on the individual level. And this one is at the uh, party level, okay? So these, the, the, so even though um, we were estimating something that varies, what varies is the intercept. So we can also, we can still get what they call the random effects. The same thing we had before, we plotted out here. We can still get that, but now it, what it adds is trying to explain why these vary, and then that something is fixed. The coefficient on LR uh, doesn't vary across parties. It's something fixed because it's at the at this level too. Um, so we see that it has a negative coefficient, but not significant. Um, so that means that parties on the right are somewhat less like the parties on the left, but not significant. So that's, no, so that's not what I explained it. Um, but I think what was more interesting was allowing the slopes to vary and not so much the, the intercepts. Um, so one problem, remember, was that the average uh, like dislike score quality varies across parties. Another one is that the relationship between religiosity and like dislike scores quality also varies across parties. So the next model what we do is we allow that relationship to vary, um, but we're not trying to explain it. Yet. So the way we do that is we add religious, the, the variable of religiosity, to the varying part of the uh, the formula here. So we did this tells the function that we want both the intercept and the uh, slope on religious on religiosity to vary across parties. So we'll run that model. When we run a varying intercept or varying slope uh, model, so here this is varying intercept and varying slope, if we're not modeling 
the uh, coefficient. We're not really that interested in looking at tables where you have you know, something like this, because we have no upper level uh, variable. I mean, we might be interested in these variables, but what's really interesting here is looking at how the coefficient on uh, religiosity and how the intercept vary. So, so rather than making a table here, the most efficient way of presenting the results when we're looking at coefficients that vary, um, so coefficients being, meaning both intercepts and slope, is just to make a graph. So here we have a graph that shows both the intercepts, along with the measure of uncertainty, um, across parties, which once again um, varies quite a bit, and then also the coefficient on the religiosity variable, which you see also varies quite a bit across parties. So this is the most efficient way, the most effective way of presenting the output uh, of varying coefficient models. Okay? So when we're not trying to model things, we're not interested so much in on one particular coefficient, so we don't look at a table, we'll look at this. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay. Studio. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try to model that. So, so the same thing we did before when we tried to explain why um, why uh, why the, some parties have higher like dislike score, scores using ideology. We're going to do the same thing for the slope on religiosity. We're going to try to explain why the relationship between religiosity and liking or disliking a party varies across parties, and we're going to see whether it's ideology, whether the effect is stronger or weaker for um, for parties that are on the right versus parties that are on the left. And the way we do that is once again by adding an interaction here. Um, by the way, this is called a cross-level interaction. So first there's the interaction between left, right, and the intercept, which is just left, right, that's one. And then here is the interaction between um, left, right, and religiosity. But we still have to put uh, both the intercept and the variable uh, whose effective thing varies in parentheses here um, to show that it's there. Does this make sense? Everyone understands this language? So in R, if you put a colon, it's it's just the uh, multiplicative term. If you put um, a star, like for multiplication, it's it's both. Um, it's basically basically to include all of this. But we, I'm not, I think this package wants us to put it this way. But this is clear that just so we can see everything. Um, so here we're trying to explain why uh, both the intercept and the slope vary across lines. We run that. This is uh, our biggest figurative model we're going to run. It took a bit longer. Uh, now, go through a summary of that. Here, uh, we can see. Um, we should look at this. So remember, uh, tables are missing for model. The variables where we try to model why the coefficients vary. Um, so here we see the coefficient on. Um, LR and the coefficient on so there's the interaction between, so LR is the interaction between the, the intercept and and, and, and the left right dummy and here uh, there's the, inter the interaction between religiosity and LR which shows us how uh, how LR uh, what, what, the extent to which LR explains why uh, the slope is higher or lower in some in some uh, for some parties so we see what uh, that's oh now uh, LR has a negative uh, negative slope, so we should see that now that once we control for this, now the the difference between a party uh, that's on the left, a party on the right, is actually negative. So parties on the right are less likely parties on the left, uh, and it's not significant. Um, but what we're more interested in here is this. Uh, this is significant, and I think is the most interesting part. Uh, so parties on the uh, So the difference between someone who's religious and someone who isn't religious is more positive for parties on the right and parties on the left. But I think it makes, makes sense, right? So you think that people who are on the right would tend to like parties, that people who are religious would tend to like parties that are on the right. Uh, whereas we don't, the, the coefficient for parties that are on the left is, is here, it's not actually significant. Um, so there's an interaction here, so you can compare these. So there's a coefficient for people on the left, or for parties on the left. Um, so people who are more religious don't like them anymore. It's actually negative, but not really significant. Um, whereas here, this is significant. So people who are on the right like parties on the right. As people who are religious, I keep confused. People who are religious, that's not the same thing. People who are religious tend to like parties on the right more than people who are not religious. 
Uh, so there's an interaction there. Um, does everyone understand what we've done so far? Um, what's wrong with what we've done so far? Are there any problems with that? No ideas? Come on. You're making it too easy now, I can just explain things. I was hoping people would identify problems that, uh, that I hadn't, hadn't thought of. <laughs> Okay, well, basically we're assuming that um, all of this is constant across elections, and also countries. So here we have a lot of things to vary across parties, but there might also be differences in average like dislike scores for different countries, different elections, um, and the relationship between religiosity and liking this like a party might vary, vary across elections. And also, the, um, and I think is the most interesting thing, the relationship between left-right, so whether a party's in the left or on the right, and how strong uh, the relationship between, between religiosity and uh, liking this like a party might vary across elections. Is, is, is that clear? I know that's really complicated, but that's like a three-way interaction there. So we have our interaction between parties, whether on the right or the left, and the effect of, uh, of religiosity on liking this like a party. And then that interaction might actually vary across elections. So you might think that in some elections, parties on the right tend to be more like that by people who are religious, maybe who aren't, but then in other elections they might not. So it might be something about political systems that explain that. It might be the other parties in the system, it might be you know, history, all kinds of things. Um, so if we just run a two-level model, we're assuming that all of this is the same and there is no variation across elections and also across countries. Um, we're gonna try to relax that assumption, but we're gonna we're not gonna do any more Bayesian models. I'm sorry, any more primitive models, we're only going to do Bayesian models from now on because it makes it a bit easier to do a uh, three level model. Uh, but we'll start out with two level models um, in, in, in the Bayesian approach. Uh, but before that, I want to talk about some more multi level stuff and then get into Bayesian analysis. So we, we, we saw some of these terms fixed effects, random effects. If you read literature both in political science, other fields, and more generally statistics, you'll find these terms a lot. And to be honest, they're really confusing to people who are not used to them. Uh, when I talked about multi-level models initially, I did not understand what these meant. It didn't make any sense. Um, if you read some of the work by uh, Andrew Gelman, you'll find out that um, he really doesn't like these word, words. And he, he basically says, well, they have, actually have lots of meanings in literature. Uh, fixed effects can mean coefficients that don't vary. They can be the mean of the coefficients across groups, which we saw. They can also be intercepts that vary across upper level units, but that we don't try to explain. Um, the random effects can be varying coefficients. They can be how the coefficients vary uh, across the mean coefficient, many different things like that. Um, but for what we saw, basically, the fixed effects were what's constant or the average, and then random effects are what vary around that. Um, Bayesians don't really think about this. For Bayesians, everything is random, so we just ignore all this. But I think the easiest way to think about multi level models is the way I presented things. So either our coefficients meaning both intercept and slope, are constant or not. And then we can vary either the intercept or the slope, um, or both. Um, and then we can try to model them or not. So we have, the first, the first decision is whether we want our coefficients to be constant or variable. The second is whether we want the intercept and the slope to vary. And the third decision is whether we want to model them, explain why they vary. Does that make sense? But I think the thing in terms of varying intercepts and varying slopes is much more intuitive than using these uh, confusing words. Everyone understands that? Okay, so now we're going to talk about some Bayesian analysis to try to understand why um, Bayesian analysis is useful, both for statistics in general and in particular for multi level models. Um, now, a question for you guys What do we assume we know before we run a frequentist model? So when we ran the model before, what did we assume we knew before, or what did we, what did we know before we ran the model? Well, a frequentist would assume that they know nothing. Frequentists assume there is no prior knowledge. And this is sort of a weird assumption because we generally we do know something. In science, we generally know something, and then we learn from our analysis, and then we we, we come to some final conclusion, well not final conclusion, but we, we come to a conclusion after running our analysis, which is based on what we knew before, 
and what uh, our analysis tells us. And that's what Bayesian uh, statistics is all about. Uh, Bayesians, um, so Freemans pretend they know nothing. Bayesians sometimes know nothing, but they're honest about it. They, they make, they're clear about it. Um, they're clear about what, whether they know something, how, how, how much they think they know. Um, that's what Bayesian statistics is all about. You know something at the beginning, or you just say you know nothing, and then you learn something from your analysis, and then you come up with, uh, with uh, some conclusion based on what you knew before and what you learned. So we combine our information with what we learned from our data, and we come up with something called a posterior. Um, so our prior is what we know before. What we learned from the data we call the likelihood. So likelihood is, is basically the probability of our dependent variable given our independent variables and our coefficients. Um, so basically, it tells us what we get from the, the data, and we combine it with what we knew before, and we come up with a posterior. Now, everything in, in, in the Bayesian world is variable is random. So we never know for sure anything. So we always have distributions. So we generally say, like for example, prior knowledge would be, we, uh, we think we know that the coefficient on a particular variable has a mean of, let's say, 2 with a standard deviation of 1. So we have a distribution on it. We wouldn't say, oh, we know the coefficient on religiosity is 2. We would say, we never say we know for sure. We always, there's always some uncertainty. And even after we run our model, and we have, we have added some information what we knew before, and we come up with a posterior, it's still a distribution. So it's always going to be a distribution. Uh, it's never, we never know for sure. It's not, it, it frequentists would assume that there's some real value of every parameter in the population, that there is a real effect of religiosity. In the Bayesian world, we, we just know what we know based on what we knew before and what we learned from our analysis, and we're constantly updating to try to, to, to get, get the best knowledge we, we can have based on what we knew before and our, and, our, and our data analysis. Okay, so this is the classic Bayesian formula. This tells us that our posterior, which is what we know after we run our analysis, depends on what we knew before, the prior, the prior times the likelihood. Um, this symbol here, which you might not be familiar with, means proportional. So it basically means that our, our, our posterior distribution is proportional to our prior uh, times our likelihood. It's not equal because there's actually a denominator there, which isn't really important. So Bayesian generally is forget about the denominator. Uh, but this is basically all you have to know. Um, all you have to know is that our pos posterior depends on what we are prior and what we before times our likelihood of what we learned from the data. Um, here's another way of putting it um, in slightly more mathematical notation. I was trying to avoid math today. This, this is the worst it's going to get. There's going to be nothing worse. There's going to be no worse than this. So, uh, this tells us that the distribution of our coefficient, knowing the data, that's on the left side here, uh, is proportional to the distribution of our coefficients before we ran the analysis, our prior, say that you find the likelihood. So the likelihood is um, the probability of, of the, uh, the data uh, given the, the coefficients. Um, so once again, the same thing, what we knew before, times what we, <coughs> what we learned from the data, and that gives us what we, uh, what we know after writing analysis. Does that make any sense? Yeah. yeah. And so it's basically kind of like instituting an on purpose bias in your data based on prior information. Is that? Uh, it's adding a bias. Well, just in the way like they're basing it on prior like, knowledge of what's going on, right? So yes. it's almost like introducing a type of like, bias term in there. And so is, is that maybe a problem? Well, I mean, bias term is probably the wrong way to think about yeah, it. Yeah, okay. Um, You're deliberately inputting something based upon prior knowledge. Yeah, um, so, so it, it can change your, your estimates. I mean, I mean, does it fact that the prior does affect the posterior. Mm -hmm. So if you put something in there that is wrong, that you know is wrong, then I'd call it a bias. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to put something in there that, that represents what you know. Mm -hmm. So if you really know nothing, then we would put as a very, um, very wide distribution. We'll see some examples in a minute. Uh, so it really depends how much you know. So you can you can tell you can you can input a distribution that's very wide that, that basically says you know nothing, etc. at zero. Um, you can put something very narrow that tells that uh, that tells your model that you know a lot, and you want the posterior to be close, the posterior to be close to that. So it really depends on how certain you are about it. Um, so I would think about it as a as a as a bias. I don't really think about it as a bias. You're putting 
wrong information. Um, but generally, it's not wrong information that we put in. Generally, we put we we make it based on, for example, previous literature. And in this case, you'll you'll see um, you'll see in a minute that our prior in multi-level models can actually come from higher levels. Uh, so, which is which is what's really cool. That's where the connection between Bayesian analysis and multi-level models comes from. Um, okay, so just some more on some key differences because I want everyone to understand statistics really well. Some some of the basics of uh, of, of classical frequency statistics, we don't understand well. I find until we learn Bayesian statistics. So you might forget all the Bayesian stuff after that today. Never want to do this again. But hopefully, you'll at least understand frequency statistics and what it's all about better, based on contrasting it with, with Bayesian statistics. Um, so if you're a frequentist, you assume that um, your data are random sample from a larger population. Replication um, is really important. Um, so you're assuming basically that. Parameters exist in the population. There is a relationship, for example, between religiosity and liking the or disliking the party in the population. And then what you have in terms of data, what your data are, 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 are a sample, a random sample from that population. So you're only observing you know, one sample out of hundreds, thousands, millions, whatever. Um, but that notion of replication is important. Uh, Frequent statistics don't make any sense if you can't conceive of. Uh, taking random samples, to take other samples, and be able to do this a large number of times, uh, because everything is based on replicating. Um, think about confidence intervals. What what is a confidence interval? It's a, it's very hard to understand what a confidence interval is. <laughs> confidence interval is not an interval that contains the true parameter uh, with ninety five percent probability. A confidence interval is something that if you were to replicate the same analysis a large number of times. 95% of the time, or 90% of the time, whatever, um, they, the, that interval, will, the interval you get, will contain the true parameter. So it's a bit, a bit of a complicated interpretation. Um, in the Bayesian world, we have credible intervals, which tell you with like 95% probability, that's what we think the parameter is. Um, so it's a more intuitive interpretation. Um, I'm not saying that confidence intervals are wrong, I'm just trying to help people understand what they are. The same thing with null hypothesis significance tests. So you might have never heard this term. This is often used by Bayesians to say that this is stupid. Um, <laughs> but I, I still like the term because I, I find it helps you understand what, what you're doing when you're running classical um, regression models or classical figure statistics in general. Um, so basically, you would say something is significant. So as soon as you're, if you're talking about significance or null hypotheses, all that, this is what you're doing. Um, and so essentially, what you're, what you're doing is you reject the null hypothesis. Maybe you're saying, well, we have this null hypothesis, which generally is zero, and you're saying that if what you find in your particular sample is sufficiently far from zero, um, that it's that, that unlikely, you will say, well, the coefficient isn't zero. That's what null hypothesis, null hypothesis significance testing is all about. Um, so it's all based on this replicability. If you couldn't conceive of redoing the analysis a large number of times, that would make um, in the Bayesian world, um, we we come up with these posterior distributions, which which show basically what we know about the parameter after we run the analysis. We actually have a whole distribution. We don't have to think about a hypothetical distribution. We have that distribution there after the analysis, and we can say how much of that distribution is above zero, for example. We can say how much is in a given range. We often will give credible intervals, which show you. Uh, what the range is that is uh, within 95% of the, you know, 95 of the center of the distribution. Um, so we can describe, describe it in many ways, um, which are really, which, which I, in general are more intuitive than, uh, than, than the classical frequentist approach. Does that make sense, people? Wait. Um, okay, so where does the prior come from? And this relates to uh, Judy's question. So it could be prior knowledge. Um, it could be from the literature. We know that something has to be positive, has to be negative, it has to be in a certain range. Well, it generally would be, it has to be, generally with a certain probability. Uh, well, it could, it could be that it has to, it could say something has to be positive. Um, but, it, but it's usually it's not, it's, it's not uh, you know, 100%. Generally, we'd have a distribution, and there's always probability that it could be bigger or smaller or whatever. Um, sometimes we might have no knowledge. Then we use what is called a non informative prior. So this would generally be a distribution centered at zero with a huge variance, huge standard deviation. So basically saying we don't really know anything. 
for memory analysis, which happens sometimes. Um, that's where we actually need to do the first model. Um, priors can also come from higher levels. So this is where um, Bayesian analysis comes in. Um, this is where it intersects with multi-level models. Um, because our prior for our coefficients at the individual level might come from what we know from, from higher levels. Okay? So you'll understand this in a minute. So to our coefficients at, you know, let's say on religiosity, we know something about those coefficients within each party based on the parties. If this doesn't make sense now, hopefully it'll make sense in the next few minutes. Um, okay, so how do you get a posterior? Um, so people used to think that you have to calculate them by hand or whatever. It's very complicated, often we can't do it. So there's actually this um, relatively easy way of doing it, which is more and more feasible given our computer power. Uh, I think everyone's computer in this room is powerful enough to write all the models today, and probably even more, uh, and, and probably even more complex models. Um, sometimes you just need to leave them for a while. But they basically do this Markov chain, mark multicolor or, or, or MCMC sampling, um, and basically they sample from the posterior distribution. Does this seem really weird to people? Or has anyone never heard of this? Um, so the idea is that you know, basically everything is, is random. There is error involved. So basically we, we take replications, we run, all, we run our model a certain number of iterations at each, each stage sampling from the posterior distribution, uh, which is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to not get into any technical difficulties. Just think, at each iteration we sample from the posterior distribution. At first, we start, we start at some point in the, in the distribution, at first our values are totally wrong, or probably, you know, maybe not totally wrong, but we assume they're wrong, uh, and we keep on sampling. And we, we, we assume that eventually we're going to get to a point where we get to the posterior distribution. And the values we get are actually, actually represent um, the posterior distribution. Does that make any sense? So then once we get that posterior distribution, we can describe it. But it takes a while to get there. So usually we have something we call burden, which we'll see in a minute, which is the first whatever number of iterations, uh, which we just throw out. We assume they're wrong. They might not be, but we assume they are. And then eventually, uh, once we've thrown it out, we get to the posterior distribution, which is actually useful information. Um, when we get to the posterior distribution, we say that our model has converged. That's the language we use. Um, and then, you know, at that point, our samples come from the. So when we, we sample at that point, uh, everything comes from the posterior. Uh, then we can summarize the results. Um, we don't have to think about asymptotic properties. We don't have to think, what if we replicated something a million times? Uh, we don't have to think about that. We just have to think about um, sampling enough until we get to the posterior distribution, then we can describe it. So, uh, so then we can say, uh, whatever proportion of the distribution is above zero, whatever proportion is below zero, we can take the center of, of the distribution and say we are 95% confident that the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the parameter is between whatever uh, value and whatever value. Does that make sense? Any questions? Uh, actually, you'll see in the code that we run in JAGS, I find this becomes really clear. I find JAGS one of the most intuitive languages because you just really see where all this comes from. Um, hopefully it'll make a lot more, a lot more sense. Um, okay, so the posterior estimates are based on uh, both the prior, as I said, and the likelihood. So it's, 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 it's basically a weighted average of both of those. So it's a weighted, a weighted average of uh, what we knew, knew before and what we, what we find now when we run our analysis. And the extent to which the prior versus the likelihood determine the posterior, so the extent to which what we knew before and what we find out during our analysis determines what we know after, depends on essentially three things. It, it depends on how much we knew before, how much we find out, and how much we find out. So how much we knew before depends on the variance on the prior distribution. So we had a distribution with a really high variance, meaning really wide, we didn't know much. So that the prior is not going to tell us, it's not going to have a major impact on the posterior. But if we have a very narrow distribution, so a small variance, small standard deviation, that says that we knew a lot before. So it's going to have a lot of impact. Um, what matters also is the variance of the data. So if our data has a very high variance, the data is not going to have a big impact. Um, if it has a low variance, it's going to have a high impact. But what actually really matters is the relative variance of the prior versus the data. Does that make sense? Uh, and also the end. So if we have a small n, the prior is going to matter more. If we have a big n, the prior is going to matter less. So basically these three things are combined to determine the posterior. Okay? 
Um, okay, so how informant requires a kind of distribution. So, so here I showed two priors, both centered at zero. So here we assume that our parameter is zero, or it has a mean of zero. Um, but in one distribution, we have a standard deviation of 0 0.01, so this one here. Uh, in the other distribution, we have a standard deviation of one. So which one is going to have more, uh, more of an impact on the posterior? Yeah, the narrow one. Because here we're basically saying that we know more of one. Okay? Um, okay, so how do Bayesian methods help with multi-level models? Well, basically, um, we, you know, we use group level, level knowledge as priors. Okay? So rather than either say we know nothing, or using priors from you know, previous literature, studies, whatever, we, um, we, we take information from the group, group level. Okay, so in a single level model, a prior for a coefficient will be something like this. So this is sort of similar we saw to what we saw before. Um, so we say uh, beta is distributed as a normal distribution with a mean of zero. And here, um, I mean, you can think of this as, okay, we'll put another thing, but this is the variance. The reason why I made it so big, um, okay, this is, a, this is a variance. Okay, so here, here we're saying we don't really know, um, we don't really know too much here, because this is a really wide distribution. This is a huge variance here, right? So here we're saying that beta comes, so this is what we know before, beta is distributed as a normal distribution, but a really wide distribution, um, so we don't really know. So this is a really not informed. Um, and this is if we have a single, if we have a multi-level model, um, when we're looking at our first level coefficients, so at the coefficients at the individual level, um, we see that they're distributed, um, so beta is distributed normal, but the mean here, which we call mu not b, comes from a higher level, okay? So the mean, the, 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 the mean there, it also has a distribution, so this, so this is the second level part of our model, um, so we say this, this, this mean, actually comes from the second level. So this is what's really cool when you look at base multi-level models, everything is really hierarchical and one thing depends on the other. So the first level here depends on a distribution of the second level. So, if it's, so here we have a really non-informative prior of the second level. Okay? But the first level, our prior comes from the second level. So this is unmodeled. So remember this is the example where we don't try to explain why, uh, for example, like dislike scores are higher in some parties than others. So then the mean, uh, like this like score for each party, comes from um, a, a very wide distribution. Does that make sense? I'm trying to think about this in a frequentist way. I mean, in the sense you're just you're just inputting a random effect. If, if that makes any sense, you're you're uh, you're saying I know that there is a random effect of the second level, the second level on the first level. Uh, but I don't know much about it, but I know there must be a random effect. Uh, by a random effect, you mean that it varies? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're not trying to model it. So this, this is the same thing we saw before, where we allow the coefficients to vary, but we don't try to explain them. Right? Um, but then we could model them. So if we do model them, we get something like what we have down here, where we say beta is distributed as a normal distribution, with mean of mu dot b, um, in my indices are another cases of the indices, but it doesn't really matter, um, where uh, mu dot b equals something. So we say the average, um, the average coefficient actually comes from the model, and u bar is an upper level variable. Uh, so we actually have a model there. Does everyone understand that? So in both cases, the prior comes from a higher level, just in one case, we're trying to explain where it comes from why the average is higher for some parties than others, and other, in the, in the, that's the second case, in the first case, we're not trying to explain it. Um, we will see this over and over again when we get to JAGS, because in the models, this, this is uh, spelled out quite clearly. Um, okay, um, one more slide, we'll take a quick break. Uh, so where do the posteriors come from? Um, okay, so th this makes me the same thing as, as we saw before for single level models. So once again, think in terms of the variance uh, of both the prior and, 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 and data, and also the end. Um, so the, the prior for level one parameters comes from uh, the second level. Um, so the, the variance matters 
at that upper level of one. So the variance actually matters at both levels. So remember that so the upper level is the prior, so that the variance at the upper level matters more. So if there's a lot of variance at the, at the second level, right, if there's a lot of variance at the second level, then the second level isn't going to have a major effect on the first level. Does that make sense? So if you know that coefficients vary a lot across parties, the actual coefficients, the, the coefficients we estimate aren't going to be based on the average coefficient, they're going to be much more variable. Uh, does, does this make sense? Well, it's not a loop, it, you know, everything depends on something higher up. So if you see that, basically, basically, basically this means that if you see there's a lot of variation across parties, um, then uh, the coefficients, estimates, will vary much more. That's basically what it tells you. Whereas if you see that they're very similar, more information from the average level for the parties will have an effect on, on coefficient estimates. Okay? Um, so the, the less variance is at the higher level, the more the higher level matters. So the more the average level for all parties will have an effect on the coefficient. Okay? And the less variance is at the lower level. Um, and also the greater the n, that means the more we know from the lower level, the more particular, you know, particular aspects of the data have an effect on on the coefficients estimated for that level. This, this probably sounds really complicated to all of you. <laughs> if you have any questions now, if not, we'll take a five minute break then. So remember that the prior in a multi level model, so prior for um, our upper, uh, for our, 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 our lower level coefficients, so the individual level coefficients, um, comes from an upper level distribution. So remember what I was saying, it all depends on variance. At both levels, and then the, the n. So the prior matters less if we have more information at the individual level. Uh, so a, a higher n, uh, a lower variance. So then, so the lower variance means that we know more, we have more certainty about it. And if the prior, uh, meaning what what we have at the higher at the upper level, is is wider, so meaning has higher variance. So what matters is the variance at the individual level versus the party level and the n for each party. So the more we know about each party, the less the prior matters. So the more we know means the higher n and the lower the variance at the individual level. Okay? Alright, um, so now we're going to get into some models, some Bayesian models. So this is, where get, this is where things get exciting. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so we're going to start with, with a really simple model. Uh, this is going to be the initial uh, linear regression, single level linear regression model. Um, so to, to run uh, Bayesian models, we use, R, uh, we use JAGs. Which we access through R2 JAG. So there's actually a couple of different packages for running JAG in R. One is R JAG, we use R2 JAG, which I find a bit easier. Um, since everything is random, this is, bit, this is based on, on running random iterations, random sampling, we set a seed, which basically means that you can replicate things. So it's not totally random then. Um, but generally, that's what you do because that way you can replicate. Like if you write a paper, you want to be able to share your, your code so other people can replicate it. And also, like today, we want we all want to get the same answers, so we use a uh, we set a C for random number generator. Um, so the way you import data into JAGS is a bit different from the way you run a normal regression. So normally, you you can use a data set uh, like a data frame, which basically a data set um, so like in spreadsheet form. We have uh, rows with 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 observations and columns with variables. In JAGS, you actually have you actually have to import a data in the form of a list. Are you all familiar with lists? So this is, this is basically not just not a matrix form. It's you know you have different elements that can be different 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 classes and you stick them all together. Um, and the reason why that it doesn't really make too much sense when you're looking at, it, at single level models. When you're looking at multi level models, it makes a lot more sense because you actually have the higher level variables at the upper level. You don't have 
you, you don't merge everything into one big data set. So let's say for parties, if you have a variable at the party level, you have the, that variable measured 66 times and not 82,000 or whatever number of times we have. So the length of the variables varies based on you know, how many units we have in the level. But now we're just doing a single level uh, model. So the easiest way to create a list is just to do this. So we uh, include the, the variables we want. Uh, we have to transform a few of them. Um, just to be, uh, so we want to, the easiest way is to make sure everything is numeric. That way, uh, since we are, in a way, sending our, our data from R to an external program, we just want to make sure everything is as clear as possible so it'll give us exactly, we know exactly what we want. So we want to make sure all the factor variables, all the categorical variables are clearly coded one or zero, and one and all one is. Um, so, so these lines that I just ran, uh, put that all together, uh, it, it created uh, our, 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 our data uh, list, in, which is called JAGS. Uh, uh, I, I call it DAT1 because I want to be able to save them all uh, at the same time. So DAT1 is model 1. Uh, and here we can see the structure of it by using the str command. So we see our first individual level variable age, our second female, religious, um, LDs, uh, income 2 and income 3. Uh, these are all individual level variables. Then we need to have our n. So we need to have the, so the large n is the total n, so is the individual level n um, for those uh, respondent party pairs. So, so it's there. So that's important um, because now we'll look at the structure of the model, uh, which seems a bit long. And this is just a simple model. This is a lot longer than writing your line of, 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 uh, for the ln function in R, but everything just flows logically. When you get to multi-level models, you really understand why this is cool. Um, but I'll explain it briefly to you. Um, so the first part of, um, of a function, so basically the model is, is set up as a function in R, but um, this isn't run sequentially. So it's not saying do this, then this, then this. You're actually specifying a model so here. So actually the order doesn't really matter. You can change things around and change that really nothing. Um, but what you find in your model specification is first the likelihood showing how your dependent variable relates to the coefficients of the independent variable. And the reason why we need the end is because we have to uh, have, we have to run this in a loop. So for creates a loop, and it does this for each individual. So for each individual, uh, it, it, it shows a relationship between their value of the dependent variable and uh, the values of the independent variables and the coefficients. So basically here what we're saying is like dislike scores are distributed normally uh, and the average comes from here. And here we're, we're specifying our, in our model, saying it's intercept plus uh, coefficient on age times age, uh, etc. Does that make sense? Uh, we also, so we have, so, so we also have to put a prior on the variance. Um, but actually in the model, we don't use the variance, we actually use the inverse variance, which is basically one over variance, uh, which is also called the precision. So the variance tells you how spread out it is. So the bigger the variance is, the more spread out your distribution is. The bigger the precision is, the more narrow the narrower your distribution is. Does that make sense? Um, so basically, tells you how much you know. Um, so you have to put priors on our coefficients and also on the variance. So here, after that, we have priors on the coefficients. So we so basically here we're saying we don't know much about them. We're saying uh, each of them, the priors. It, it, um, the, each coefficient in our prior is distributed normally with a mean of zero with a very low precision, so very wide distribution. We don't know much about them. So here we're basically doing something similar in a way to what frequencies do. We're saying we don't really know much before we run the model. We also need to put a prior on the precision, on the inverse variance. Um, that we do sort of in two steps. So tau is our precision, but, um, and then sigma actually is our, is our variance. So we, we say that the prior for the variance is a uniform distribution, which is here, a really wide uniform distribution, so we're not inputting too much information. Um, now let's, um, are there any questions about the model? I hope it's not too complicated. If you, if after a while, I find this becomes quite intuitive. Uh, it might look like a lot for now, but um, hopefully it'll make sense after a while. So you have to play with it a bit to understand. Um, okay, so we'll run that. It doesn't really do anything. It just compiles the model. It just puts it into this object here called model one, model one, uh, model one dot jags. Um, now we have to tell jags which parameters we want to see. 
So JEG runs all these iterations, and at each step, it saves some of the parameters, but it doesn't have to save all of them. We can actually take out some of these, and we'll go faster. This actually takes a parameter. So this is why it can become slow and take a while, because each iteration stores uh, some of the information. Um, and this, this we're telling JAG we wanted to store. We're actually not necessarily interested in all of this. Um, we'll, 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 add, we'll, add, we'll add all of these. Um, yeah. OK. Now um, we'll just run the quick model. Um, so here we're telling this JAG command here, we're assigning to the results object uh, the output. I'll put a JAGS command and the JAGS command first. Uh, we have a number of arguments. We say the data is this, so data is JAGS and that one. Parameters are saved, tell JAGS which parameters to keep, which are what we put here. Um, model file is the model, uh, so we put model1.jags. Then we tell JAGS how many chains. Um, so basically, normally, when we run a Bayesian model, we run more than one chain. So we want to be able to check to make sure everything has converged at the end. So we have two different chains. So we run two different random, you know, Markov chain, Monte Carlo simulations, starting at different random variables. We want to make sure. So we know at the beginning they're not at the right, they're not the posterior distribution. So these are different random values, and we want to. We hope ultimately that both of them will will reach the posterior distribution. But the reason why we went two is that we can check. So if we start out these chain different var different values, and we we see that they end up converging to the same distribution, then we know that um, we want the model must have converged. Okay? Then we tell R how many, or JAGS rather, how many iterations we want to do. Here we're just going to do 100. But actually in the results that are on uh, the slides, I did uh, 1,000. Um, and, and a 50 burn-in. So burn-in is, burn-in uh, basically represents the initial iterations where, um, where we basically assume that we're, we're, we're not in posture distribution yet, so we just throw them out. So basically this here is going to save 50 iterations. So it throws out the first, uh, it runs 100, but it throws out the first 50, and only keeps uh, 50, and it's going to keep uh, the values of these properties with each iteration. Okay? So we'll run the quick one with just uh, 100 iterations. And see, even with that, it takes uh, a bit of time, but it shouldn't take too long. And then there will be a really quick way of, of, of checking these models, which will be to use a Gelman result uh, plot, filled uh, in by Andy Gelman. Uh, okay, so it's finished on my computer, I don't know about yours. Oh, that's coming up to the top now, Oh, okay. Okay, well, I mean, you can follow along here. Um, hopefully, it'll work later. Um, so, we will plot the output from JAGS. Uh, which Okay, so here, here you can see it. Um, so here, this is a Gelman plot. So it shows you a, a quick, um, gives you a quick overview of the distribution. So you see that there are there are two dots, colored dots. One is green, one is like red. Uh, one for each chain. So that gives you the mean value for each chain. And you can see that they're not totally, you know, there's a difference. There's a difference between them, which tells you that the model has converged yet. That's because we haven't a lot of iterations. So if we were to run this a thousand times. Actually, probably the last one converge. We find that basically the, the dots would be indistinguishable. Well, this gives you, uh, so, so as you read some of the distribution, it gives you 80% intervals. So, what is covered by 80% of the distribution? And we can see what is basically distinguishable from zero. Um, so, here basically nothing is, but that's because we haven't run it long enough. But if we were to run it long enough, we would get the results that are on the, um, on the slides. We basically saw the same thing before. That uh, people who are more religious, if I remember correctly, um, yeah, people who are more religious like parties more. So here, these are the results. If you were to run this thousand iterations, here's the mean value of the coefficient. So this basically describes the posterior distribution. So this is the mean, standard deviation, and here uh, there are 95% credible intervals, 
So, so this tells us that we are 95 percent um, confident that the that the um, the value of that coefficient is between 0.03 and 0.10. The mean uh, value is uh, 0.07. So people who are more religious tend to like parties more in the second level model. Now we can easily assess um, convergence here by looking at R hat. R hat is um, it's basically a Gelman, uh, Gelman convergence test. Uh, if it's close to, to one, that means that the model is converged. So if it's above one, uh, we should run this for longer, run the model for longer, for more iterations to get to converge. It basically tells you how much the, uh, if I remember correctly, how much narrower the uh, the credible intervals would be if we were to run it uh, for longer. What's, what's, what is close to one? I mean, does 0 0.9 is close I would say like plus or minus 10%. We we'll try to get it as close as possible. Um, I mean, we're never sure we've converged. We, we only have, there are actually a lot of other tests you can do, and basically they'll just tell you whether you have a converge. So if you see it's totally wrong, um, you can actually see in your results, uh, wait, I'll go back to the Gunnar plot, you can actually see, you actually, actually here it's it's close enough that it's indistinguishable from one, um, but here, yeah, you're looking enough detail. But there, in, in, on the uh, upper left corner, the second the second little plot there shows you the R hat value, so you can actually see it quickly there. But it, it's, they're too close to one to be able to distinguish at this point. Um, another place you can see them, is after you've run the model, we'll go back to, uh, to our studio, you can uh, print the results, where I say print the results screen. You can play around with, with these objects here, see what they are, but here I, I basically extracted the information you need. Full screen again. Um, so there you've extracted the information you need, and it gives basically the same stuff as on the slide. You can see the, the R hats here. Okay, so basically, it's very close to convergence. Um, actually, it's basically converged. I would just run it for more iterations because we can see that the distributions are slightly different. Um, but the, the estimates here are probably not uh, too far off. Although this, this effect here is so small that I think, yeah, the effect of, I, I wouldn't put too much confidence in the effect on religiosity really ever because it was uh, at a single level, it was just because the end was so big. Uh, and then here, this route to just to um, send the results to LaTeX, uh, which is what I put on the slide. Does, does this make sense to people? Any questions? Okay, now we're going to move to the multi-level version. So we've already run the first few models. We've already run already. So now we're going to look at the and the very intercept model. So now we're going to um, input the data in the same way. The only thing is now we need to have a variable for party. So this is how we create the second line here. Creating the data creates this variable, uh, which is basically a numeric variable going from one to sixty-six uh, for each. Uh, for basically for each observation, so like which party it's, it, it, it's at, and then it adds, it counts the, the total number of unique um, indicators for the party, and it gives you the number of parties uh, which we need as we see in the model code. So now this code here for the model is the same. So now we call it mod, mod 2 that genetics. The only difference, see here everything's the same. The only difference is that uh, the intercepts. Here we call it v.party, because it's the intercept for each party. Now we allow it to vary. So we subset um, the intercept by saying for party i, this is the particular intercept. So remember it's a loop. So for each i, for each individual party pair, there will be a, an intercept, and that intercept depends on the party. Okay? So party remember is a variable that says which party corresponds to that in, uh, respondent party pair, and then um, that determines which intercept you have. And then we actually have to have uh, another loop for the variables that are at the, the uh, second level, and that's here. Remember the priors. So right here we set, like as in the other model, we set priors for the individual level coefficients. The one that don't vary, but we have to set priors now for the coefficients that do vary. There's actually one that varies here, and that's the, the intercept. Um, and the way we do that is we create a second loop. Um, remember, the, the, if you don't know too much about computers, it doesn't really matter. I mean, for computer programming, it doesn't really matter. You understand the code exactly, but just to give you a general idea, we say once again for each party, this is the intercept, and it's distributed normally. Okay? 
uh, and, and distributed, distributed normally around a mean, uh, which is the mean for all parties, and actually which comes from a prior. So we actually have a mean, we actually have a prior for the mean of all intersects. And we don't really know too much about that mean, so we give it a, you know, a, also a very wide distribution set at around zero. And then we have to now have a prior for the, the variance both at the individual level and at the party level. Okay? So remember, so we, so we have priors on all these uh, individual level coefficients. So some so on the variables that don't vary, so for the coefficients that don't vary, we have the priors are here, the same as in the single level model. For the coefficients that, that vary, we have, and actually there's one, the prior is in this party loop here. We said for each party, the, uh, the, the intercept is distributed normally. So, so each party will have its own intercept, but it's distributed normally around the overall mean. Okay? Does that make sense? And now uh, everything else is basically the same. We'll run that. So, so remember, this is the varying intercept model. So we, we're going to get a bunch of intercepts for each um, for each party. We could get the same uh, graph as before. Um, I find the easiest way to display these types of results is by running uh, this here. Um, so this here, what this does, so this this uses ggplot ggplot two, and it creates a really nice graph. Um, rather than waiting for it to run, I'll just show you we are going to. But if you were to run, wait and, and, and let this run. What this here would do is it would extract the results and then it would create the graph. Um, actually, by the way, um, if you see that your model hasn't converged either in the Gelman uh, plot or uh, looking at results you know, in the table form, like looking at the R hats, if you see it hasn't converged, what you can do is rather than running it again, you can update it. So you can continue where you, where you stopped with the previous model by updating the results. Actually, I can do that here. So if you use the update function, on the object that came out of your previous model run, and you say, I want 200 more iterations, or it could be 1,000 or whatever. Um, and then you run that, and then it creates another object called results. Then we, um, so then here we extract the, all the coefficients. Just what it does is it creates a data frame with a, a row for each iteration and a column for each, uh, for each coefficient. Uh, and then we want to extract the intercepts, which we call v.parties. So this is how we extract the intercepts. So here we end up with a, with, um, with a data frame with only the intercepts. Okay, and we can do that because this is finished running on my computer at least. Um, so to make this graph, you need a ggplot2, which generally is, which you would have by default. You also need these two other packages called dplyr and reshape2. If you don't have those, you should install them. You probably don't have dplyr. You might not have to reshape two, so you might have to run the same thing, but with reshape two. Um, and once you have those, you can make this really cool um, graph. Uh, okay, actually, I didn't load these packages. So make sure you load those. You can make this really cool ggplot um, graph, which will be. Okay, um, so now the graph is here. So we have the graph like this. So this shows us the intercept for each party um, along with 90% credible intervals. So this, uh, this is an interval in which we're 90% uh, confident that it contains the, the coefficient, which is the intercept. So we're 90% confident that, that the intercept is you know, in that range, and then it gives the mean value. And what this code actually does is sorts them from um, the biggest uh, coefficient, the most positive, to the smallest one. Okay? You might think that these labels here on the, the left here are sort of weird. You can actually change those really easily. Um, I, I've included code here to change them. 
Um, and then it gives you labels which are the party levels. And actually, if you have the names of the parties, if I really take time, I could extract them from the code book and then put those along with y axis. But if you were to you know, write a paper, you might want to do that. Um, okay, does that make sense? So remember when, that one, when we allow coefficients, either whether it's the intercept or the slope to vary, this is the kind of output we want with graphs like this. Okay? We wouldn't necessarily want to look at a table because we saw the stuff you can see in the table. Um, okay, now we're going to model uh, the variant intercepts. We, so the same thing we did before, we want to see whether intercepts are um, either bigger or smaller for parties in the right versus parties in the left. So we want to see whether the average like to dislike score is higher for parties in the right or parties in the left. So we're going to set up our data again. We just added one variable, which is um, left, right, which we've added there. Let me go back to full screen as well. Uh, okay, so now the, the, the model function uh, here is called mod3.jags. Uh, so the, 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 the individual level, level likelihood here is the same. Um, but now when we, we look at our prior for the intercepts, it's a bit different. So now again, um, the intercepts are distributed normally. With a mu, uh, with, with, with a mean, uh, around a mean, but the mean now varies by party. Because each party has, you know, we model it, so each party's mean depends on variables at the party level. Actually, one particular variable, which is uh, left, right, whether it's on the left or on the right. Um, so if a party is on the left, LR is going to be zero. So the mean is going to be B0. Does everyone see that? So this is basically the linear model here. Uh, so the mean is going to be zero, and then the intercept is going to be red, is going to be, uh, it's going to come out of a, a normal distribution uh, with that mean, which is going to be zero. But if the party is on the right, the mean is going to be, this is going to be 1, so the mean is going to be v0 plus v dot lr, and so the intercept is going to be, uh, is going to be, come out of the normal distribution, uh, and it's going to be, uh, so v dot party is going to give that normal distribution, and with the mean v0 plus v uh, dot lr. Uh, we still have priors for all the non varying coefficients here, uh, but now we have to put since this is essentially a linear model, and since these coefficients here are not modeled by an upper level, we have to put priors for these coefficients here in the same way as we did for the single uh, for the, um, the, the the individual level model. So those we put here, and we again say we don't know anything about them. So we put uh, very wide coefficients at zero. Here we're variances again. So now let's run that. Okay, um, I'll go back to the slides and show you the outputs. So now since we're actually modeling something, remember when you're modeling uh, varying coefficients, you're sort of more interested in the table because there you can actually see the coefficient estimate. So now we're going to look at the slides. We have this here. This is a model varying intercept model. Um, so here we, we see the uh, individual level variables which do not vary. Um, but here we have it. Uh, so these are individual, this individual. This is level two variable. V dot uh, LR is a level two variable. V dot LR is the coefficient of that variable. We see that uh, the mean of the posterior distribution is positive, 0.37. Standard deviation here. 95% um, uh, so credible intervals. Negative here, positive here. So that means that the 95% credible intervals overlap zero. So we can't really be 95% confident that this coefficient is positive. And you know, the mean value is positive. But remember, in the previous model, we found the same thing. That there was no significant effect of, of uh, being on the left or the right, and, uh, and how, and any intercepts, how, how like parties are on average. So uh, we're going to now look at the, the coefficients, which we're all, we're all allowed to vary. We're going to run uh, another model. 
So now we're going to have unmodeled varying intercepts and slopes. So what changes now, if you look at the individual level part of the model, here at the top, we see uh, we see v dot party is subsetted by party again. It's the same as before, but now what we've added, if you go all the way here to the right, the coefficient on religious and religiosity is the same thing. So there's a different coefficient for each party. Okay? So now when we go to our party loop, so we define the priors for, um, for the, the varying coefficients, we have to have a line for party, so for the intercept, and also for the coefficient on religiosity. But now they're not modeled, so in both cases, they come from uh, you know, a mean, which is the same for all parties. Okay? And then we also have our, 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 our variance factor position as well. So we'll run, the, we'll run this model. And I think I'll just go back to the slides and show you the graph. So once again, these are varying, varying coefficients, so uh, the on model, the varying slope and intercept. Um, and here I made a graph, again in ggplot, uh, where we see the coefficient across parties. I didn't make a nice label there. Um, but you can see how the coefficient varies across parties, uh, along with 90% credible intervals. So you can see for some parties, um, the coefficient is, is positive, for others it's negative. So for some parties, people who are more religious are a bit, have, have like dislike scores that are you know, about 1.5 uh, higher than, 1.5 points higher than people who are not religious. For other parties, it's the opposite. People who are more religious have like dislike scores that are about minus 1.5 uh, lower than people who are, people who are, people who are not religious. So we see a lot of variation across parties, and that's, I think that's pretty cool, right? I, I think this is a cool output that you get from lots of different models. Um, is this cool? Okay, now we're going to try to explain that. So uh, our next model is, remember this was the most complicated model we had in, in, ran in, frequentist, um, in the frequentist approach. Uh, if you have money of all the codes, so everything I, I put on the slides, you have the code for, so you can grab the gaps, like everything. So if you want to learn R stuff, you can learn some R just by, by looking at this code. Um, okay, so now our th this is the model where we, where we try to explain why the coefficient on religious varies across parties. And we try to do that using the LR uh, left-right variables. We want to see whether the coefficient is more positive or more negative for a party on the right, party or versus party on the left. And we, we're also modeling our, our intercept as well. Uh, usually, you, you, you want to model both. Uh, okay, so we'll set up the data. Now, look at the model. So, the individual level model is the same as before. It's only when we get to the priors for the coefficients of the individual level that things change a bit. Um, so, remember we've already seen this with party. We've seen how the mean differs for each party, and it differs when we're modeling it. We have an intercept and a slope on LR at that level. So remember, this is um, the mean intercept for, for parties on the left. This is the mean intercept for parties on the right. Okay? So we see that the mean uh, varies based on parties' ideology. Same thing now for the coefficient on religiosity. So the coefficient on religiosity, religi uh, religiosity is distributed normally with a mean that varies by party, and we model that varying mean. So the mean coefficient is going to be b2 for parties on the left. It's going to be b2 plus b dot lr2 for parties on the right. Does that make sense? And then we have to have priors again for all these second level coefficients. And once again, we say we don't know anything about them, so we just put really wide um, priors on those. Once again, um, we have uh, variance or precision uh, priors for all of those. Okay, so what we're, we'll run that. Um, it's actually going to take a very long time, um, so maybe I'll just go back to the results on the slide, but you guys can run them on your computers and see how long it takes. Uh, so now, uh, since we're modeling coefficients here, we're going to look at the table here. Um, so here we have uh, 
So here we have the, the, the second level coefficients and some of the first level. I'm not sure why I'm why missing some of the first level coefficients, but it doesn't really matter. Um, we'll, here we'll look at some. So remember, v1 and v2 are the average uh, are the average slope and intercept for parties on the left. Okay, uh, sorry, the intercept and slope. So v1 is the average intercept for parties on the left. v2 is the average slope for parties on on the left. Um, so it's so the way we're interested in the slope now. So the mean is zero. But what's more interesting is um, that it actually overlaps zero. So it's not particularly interesting. What's more interesting is is, is uh, this here, which also overlaps zero, and well, we'll explain that in a minute. Um, that's why we get to three level models. So here we see that parties on the right, um, to, for parties on the right, people who are religious tend to like them uh, more than people who are not religious. Um, but it's um, it's not as true for it's not really true for parties on the left because the other the coefficient is zero. In frequency terms, this isn't really significant because it overlaps to zero. But maybe if we're to take 90 percent credible intervals, it, it might not overlap to zero, I'm not sure. Um, but you might think, well, maybe that's because it varies across elections, right? Um, so maybe this is the wrong way of looking at things. Here we're basically assuming that the, uh, the relationship between party's ideology and how much religion matters for liking them is the same in all political systems. That it doesn't really matter what the party system's like, it doesn't matter what the history of the country is, none of that matters. But you probably think that it does matter. So we wouldn't necessarily find the same relationship in all elections. We find we'd expect in some elections, you might find you, you would you would find that that ideology matters more in conditioning a relationship between religiosity and like or dislike a party. Uh, and in other elections it doesn't matter. And we can think of lots of different variables at the election level that would explain that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're not going to model um, varying coefficients at the third level. We're going to introduce the third level. Uh, in this model, I'm going to warn you, takes a very long time to run. I think it took me about 45 minutes on my computer yesterday. Um, but I want to explain it to you, and, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll be able to understand that. Please ask questions. We still have about 10 minutes. Um, uh, but I really wanted to get into this. Uh, Three, uh, there's three level models. You can really see that it's not that complicated. I know the code is really long, but since everything is hierarchical and you know one thing depends on another, it's actually quite intuitive. You, you'll be able to write this if you play around with JAG stuff. It won't take you too long. First, we need um, we need an, indica an indicator variable. Um, well, that variable basically says which election each party is in. Uh, that's a bit complicated to do, so there's a, there's a few lines of code here that do that. You don't have to understand them. If you really want to learn R well, take a look at that. Um, but it's not like, well, just run that, those lines of code, and then you, you ignore them for now. Uh, now we set up the data. Uh, the only difference now is we have that indicator for elections here, which is called election, and then we have to count the number of elections. Because they're basically just going to be adding another loop. So we're just adding priors now for the second level coefficients. In another, you know, another loop, which gives priors that come from the third level, which is the election level. Okay, so now we'll look at the model. So here, at the individual level, everything is the same. Nothing changes from the last model. What changes now is at the party level. Now we have the same thing, but now our coefficients at the second level are subsetted, meaning the coefficients actually vary across elections. So we're saying for the election in which party J ran. Um, this is the this is the coefficient, okay. But now we have to add priors for those coefficients. So the priors come from the third level here. So now we have to write a loop uh, for elections. So we're saying for each election, the uh, b b one. So k is, so b one is subset by k. So the b one is distributed normally with a mean of this and a Precision tau dot v1 this. So we're allowing uh, all those coefficients that uh, for the model of, of uh, intercepts and slopes at the individual level to vary by election. Okay? So the mean, uh, so once again we need to have priors on the mean and, 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 and the precision. So we put the mean 
to the means here, and we say we don't really know much about them. We give a really wide uh, prior for those uh, centered at zero, and we have uh, priors for the variance as well. Uh, now we we tell um, we tell the drags actually, actually the same thing. In the last model. These are the coefficients we want to monitor. We want to monitor. We want to keep. Actually, that's why the table is the same thing. It only reported these these the ones we're interested in. Um, I will run this model. Actually, no, I won't run it. Um, I'll just show you the results. So here we have the code again to make the ggplot um, plot with the, the varying coefficients. But now, what are the varying coefficients we're interested in? What are we interested in as far as coefficients? Are we interested in the um, the coefficients on religiosity, how they vary across parties or elections? No one has any idea? What's, what's interesting here? I mean, a lot of things are interesting. But why, why did we go to the third level model? Why, why did we add a third level? What? The election levels. Well, we have three three levels now. So we had we saw that um, we saw that religiosity varies across parties, but uh, left right didn't explain that. But we might think that the extent to which ideology explains the relationship between religiosity and likely second parties, we might think that that varies across elections. So what we're really interested in is. The coefficients on left right, right? So we want to see how ideology conditions that individual level relationship across elections. Um, so the output uh, of this model is another really cool graph. So this is another thing. Is, okay, first the Gelman plot. Uh, so this was after. A lot of iterations. I think I said this for 10,000 iterations to get this converge. So we can see uh, a lot of parameters here. We can see all the R hats are around one. Uh, and here we can see, oh, I think we can see how uh, the coefficient on religiosity varies. We can see how the coefficient on LR1 and LR2 varies. Um, so remember, this is modeling the intercept and this is modeling the uh, slope. So this tells us how. The slope on religiosity varies uh, based on whether parties on the right or on the left, right? Uh, and now we have those slopes plotted plot out. So we have a very small number of parties here. Um, uh, sorry, a very small number of elections, only 11. But we basically find that, uh, so these are the mean estimates on LR2, uh, beta uh, BLR2, and uh, we have 90 credible numbers. So we're not, we're not, gonna, we're not modeling. Uh, the second level coefficients, we just want to see how they vary across elections, and we see that they do. Um, here's some, I think it's the smallest. We see only one of them is distinguishable from zero. So we'd only be confident at the here at 90 percent level that this one is positive. So for this election here, uh, I don't have labels, but we can find out which one it is. For this election, um, parties that are on the right uh, tend to have, so for parties on the right, people who are more religious like the more they go on the left. Uh, but only really on, in that election. Um, so this is very complicated. We have three levels here. But does this make any sense? So think about everything in terms of hierarchy. You can you get from the first level. To the, well, actually, you think the third level determines the second level, the second level determines the first level, and it's also the priors. Okay. Have any questions? We've been through a lot today. Um, I initially promised. When I plan this, then we would look at uh, binary dependent variables as well, which are very common in political science and the social sciences in general. Um, so I did put an example in the code at the bottom. Um, oh, I did put the code for the frequency versions of the three level. I think that I think this is right. Try this. I'm pretty sure this is the right way to do it. Um, I'm just not sure because I've never done it before. But, but try. You can try. Maybe not now because it'll probably take a while. But you, you can run a three level model using Gallon Yard. I think this is the right code. Um, okay, uh, so, so I wanted to give you one model uh, with a binary dependent variable. So here it's basically the same thing. I just created a binary dependent variable, which is whether people give like dislike scores for each party that are 
higher than five, so higher than the midpoint. Um, so here, so instead of using LMER, you use GLMER, and similar to when you you know use GLM to, to run you know logits, um, you have to finally put binomial and then link logit, um, but everything else is the same. The exact same code is, is for um, oh actually this is should be this should be really just I want what I was going to think of. So this is the same code as when we ran the, the varying um, uh, every word says income, it should be religious. Um, the varying coefficients, um, suppose slope and intercept, and we try to model them using LR. Um, so you can run this code to do that. And then, uh, I, I know, uh, actually, yeah, so actually here I use the wrong variable. I'll, I'll change that, I'll put it up to date version of the, 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 the R, R file. But here uh, we have the code, the Bayesian version, to do, uh, to run. Uh, a binary dependent variable model. Uh, do you guys see the same? Do you guys have the same code? Is this where you download? It? Okay. Uh, this this should run. So basically, here we're saying is uh, this dependent variable is distributed uh, according to a Bernoulli distribution with this probability, and here's how this probability relates to uh, to uh, the linear predictor, which is uh, you know the linear model, and then we have priors on here. Um, yeah, that's what you do. Are there any questions about that? Does all this make sense? Was it a lot of information for one day? Yeah, the ICPSR will learn this over, especially the introductory base course. So we have a month to learn. I mean, this and other stuff. But I'm. But I mean, the point wasn't necessarily for you guys to be able to. Go through JAGs and do this all, all of this. I mean, you can learn this over time on your own by playing around with it. The idea was to help you guys understand multi level models. Like, did you guys find it was useful to understand multi level models to look at this notion of priors and posteriors and where we can come from? Because multi level model, model is basically big. Even if you run a pre this version, in many ways it is big. Um, so, I personally find it much more intuitive than talking about random effects and types of effects. Do you have any questions? Do you have like a good book to suggest? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll take a look at this. Okay. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. Uh, if you have models that are running, uh, if, you, if you really do try using JAGs, you'll over, over time, I'll learn the code, but you'll realize that there's a lot of debugging involved. Because uh, you need to have the right priors, the right dimensions. A lot, a lot of things have to be right, and they, you'll have to try a lot for a while. So often, it's best to start with a simple model. So, sort of what we did, you'll start with a single level model, you add the varying intercept and varying slopes, then you model that, and you find out a third level, but slowly build it up. Because um, you want to make sure that the simplest models work, then you add other stuff. So, once you show the simple stuff works, you add. For complex stuff, that's the way it is where to do it. Um, but feel free to send me your code if it really isn't working. Um, if you want to learn some more about uh, multiple models, the classic book, probably the, probably the best statistics book I've ever written, is the, the Gallman and Hill book. Uh, it's very cheap. You can, I think, if you buy the paper version, it's like sixty-two dollars, something like that, on Amazon. You can get either the Kindle version, which is really useful because I have it on my iPad, out of my computer, so I have it everywhere. It's about thirty-two dollars, something like that. Um, it's a really good statistics book. It starts out, it's, it actually is similar to the way I presented things. It starts out with frequent stuff and it moves into Bayesian. Um, it starts out with single level, so it goes through linear regression, logistic regression, all that stuff, and of course, regression, um, and then moves on to multi level, then moves on to Bayesian stuff. It actually uses a different program. It uses bugs instead of JAGs. You might have heard of bugs. The code is almost identical. The only difference is that bugs only runs on Windows. Um, it's also not as used as much these days. I, I think JAG is more popular these days. Um, and, and bugs, I'm not sure they've updated recently. I actually have a like, computer. You can actually, there's actually a way to, to install it on a Mac. Um, but there, there are very few things you can run in bugs you can't do JAGs. So I think most people these days are just using JAGs. Um, so you, 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 can use, you can run the code that's in the other book. Just, um, you have to, just if you want to use R2 JAGs, just write, write it the way I did it today. Um, 
If you want to learn more generally about Bayesian uh, statistics, so there's three uh, big books, um, all, all by political scientists. There's the um, Gellman et al. book, Bayesian Data Analysis. There's the book by uh, Jeff Gill that just came out, uh, Bayesian Method and Social and Behavioral Science Approach. And there's a book by Simon Jackman, Bayesian Analysis for the Social Sciences. They're all good. It's just um, people who uh, do Bayesian analysis often tend to be really bright people who don't necessarily know how to explain it to everyday people. I find that the best introduction to Bayesian statistics is probably the multi-level uh, book because it doesn't, there's not that much math and it's relatively well explained. It was going to explain it in a way that's similar to what I do today. There's some, there are more formulas than I presented, but I find it's relatively intuitive. And it's, and it's introduced from a multi-level point of view, so it, it, I find it makes it easier to understand. Um, any other questions? No? Okay, so we'll end it there. Hopefully this was useful for you all, and, uh, mm -hmm. and you'll be running some multi-level models too. Hopefully. Have a good day.